Well, today we turn to one of the most important topics of our times, and that is global challenges for food and agriculture, um, both the geopolitical and the uh, humanitarian aspects of this issue. And it's my pleasure to introduce our guest, Boyd Hate, to you. It's always a pleasure to uh, draw on the talents of one of our own members, and that is, in fact, uh, the case today. <laughs> Boyd Haight began his career in the Central African Republic, where he was a Peace Corps volunteer for two years. Uh, he then decided he'd like to stay on in that area, and he um, stayed on for two additional years as a United Nations volunteer in the same country. So armed with this background and this experience and uh, a BA from Stanford and an MA from UC Davis, he went on to join the professional staff of uh, the Food and Agriculture Organization of the United Nations, where he worked for 35 years. Uh, Boyd has worked in more than 50 countries. He lived in Kenya, Zambia, and Zimbabwe, uh, in addition to the Central African Republic. And he ultimately rose to the position of director of the FAO. Uh, and in that capacity, lived in Rome for 22 years, where FAO has its, maintains its headquarters. And I must say, we all look with some envy on that assignment. Um, Boyd and Susan uh, are now retired. They spend half of their year in Monterey and half of their year in Korea, Maine, that's spelled C-O-R-E-A, and it's another lovely town on the north coast of Maine, sort of north of Bar Harbor. So we're delighted that uh, Boyd is a member of the World Affairs Council, that he's here with us this afternoon, and most of all that he's agreed to share his experience and his expertise with us. So please join me in welcoming him. Thank you, uh, Judy, for the very nice uh, introduction, and also thank you, Larry, for inviting me to uh, make this presentation to the World Affairs Council. Um, and um, I'm pleased to see that uh, the World Affairs Council has already had a uh, presentation and discussion on aspects of California agriculture. Uh, earlier this year, which showed us the importance of this, uh, this topic uh, to the group. And I am going to look more broadly at the uh, global context and the trends in food and agriculture and the opportunities to address those, um, the challenges that, uh, that arise both in the national, but more importantly at the, uh, the international level. Let me just see if I can make sure this works. Okay. So um, first, uh, I want to touch on uh, what is the internationally agreed definition of food security, uh, which has four uh, main elements and provides a framework for the analysis of uh, local, national, and global levels of food security uh, and uh, production. So these elements, first is the availability of food. Uh, which relates to the production, which we commonly think of farming, uh, but also the uh, production of crops, livestock, and fish, uh, but also the holding and reserve, uh, particularly grains, uh, in cases uh, where there are shortages, and then the, uh, the international market, national and international markets for, for food. So, uh, First, you have to have food before you can do anything else. The second is the access to this food at the household level and at the individual level. And this relates both to the physical availability of food, particularly for farmers, which is fairly obvious. You're growing food, you have it there at the home. But more importantly, uh, these days, is the ability to purchase food uh, because the majority of people are now living in uh, urban areas. The third element is the utilization. So once you have food and you have access to it, what do you do with it? And this is, relates to uh, nutrition uh, and uh, energy intake, energy intake being the caloric content, and the nutrition uh, being micronutrients. And finally, the stability of these three elements 
because if you have breaks in the availability or in the access uh, or in the type of food, nutritive value of food, you may have in the short term uh, still have problems with, you, you may have food insecurity. Now let's just take a look at uh, the situation of uh, world food and agriculture today. Not, this doesn't look forward, it just looks at today. Um, in terms of production and access, uh, currently it's, and it's globally, uh, it's stable at the global level. However, we are essentially producing at the global level more food than is needed in caloric terms. We take population, multiply by daily caloric needs, uh, we're producing more food. But there is quite a bit of regional and local variability uh, in surpluses and deficits. And uh, by food type, uh, by location, and a, a, the biggest example is this, is that the United States is a, has a uh, surplus production of cereal crops, maize, I think of maize, or we use the, word, the international term for corn is maize. That, that's always what I've used. I try, try to use corn. Uh, corn, wheat, rice, uh, as well as soya. Uh, but we import, we don't produce enough, and we import fish, a lot of fish. So uh, in terms of uh, the production side, uh, even though we produce enough, more than enough food to eat. Uh, we have some more of some types and not enough than others. And the production is also affected by vari variations in climate, uh, and particularly climate extremes. Uh, we hear about uh, hurricanes and floods, for example, in Central America, where there will uh, all of a sudden be a reduction uh, in food. Also economic uh, situations where uh, economies are on the downside and conflict Two examples of that, uh, particularly with civil strife, are Venezuela and Zimbabwe. Both of these countries are, have tremendous, uh, in the past, surplus food production. Zimbabwe was a food exporter in southern Africa and is now uh, in desperate uh, uh, straits because of civil strife. Uh, in terms of food security being the uh, access and particular utilization elements of food security, I think the, the key issue here is that there are still 820 million people in the world who are hungry. That is, they do not have enough to eat. They either don't have food or they, or they are eating way below the caloric uh, requirements. And uh, there are, in, including those 820 million, there are essentially 2 billion people, that's about a third, almost a third of the world population, uh, which have moderate food insecurity, that is irregular or uncertain access. Now you might wonder how we get these figures. Uh, the Food and Agriculture Organization has for decades been measuring uh, food uh, availability and uh, particular uh, access based on caloric uh, availability. And however, in the last uh, four years, we have switched over to uh, a food insecurity experience uh, scale, which is a Gallup uh, run poll by the Gallup organization worldwide that simply asks people, uh, it's not just one question, but the question is basically, are you hungry? Do you have enough to eat? And this has given, uh, there's a lot of discussion whether it's more accurate or not, but it does enable uh, us to look at more what's happening at the individual level. The second uh, big issue with food security is the prevalence of obesity and overweight. And this is a, a growing epidemic. Uh, overweight is defined as having a body mass index uh, of 25 or more. Body mass index is your is your weight in kilograms divided by the square of your height in meters. So you don't have to worry about the formula. But, but anybody can calculate. I'm sure many of you probably have BMI. You follow your BMI. So uh, there there are 1.9 billion adults who are 
over, uh, overweight or obese. And um, the obesity part of it has tripled since 1975. Uh, this is happening because of the uh, gr energy, growing energy dense content of processed food, and particularly with sugar, and uh, also combined with physical activity uh, for the particular people working in, in urban areas. Uh, and it's important to realize that uh, overweight and obesity occurs in both developed and developing countries. It's not just in developed countries. And, it's, and that is also related to the composition of food uh, being consumed. So uh, in a nutshell, that's where we stand. We produce more than enough food. Its, act, its distribution and access is uneven. You have people who are, uh, do not have enough to eat, and at the same time, you have a large number of people who are eating, essentially eating too much. So you have a real Im imbalance here. And I just have a couple of uh, charts just to show you in terms of the, the number of hungry people. In fact, this is, this is a figure that's, that's quite often uh, thrown out by the international community, saying, okay, uh, after about 2000 and up to about uh, 2000, 15, the number of hungry people was going down. Yeah, it was up close to a billion uh, in 2000. It has come down uh, to close to this 820 million. But since 2015, it's been flat. And you can see that. Use my little uh, here. The, uh, the the actual number, in fact, is starting to go up. And percentage terms, uh, also, it's just slightly going up. So. There were good progress was being made worldwide. Of course, the target had been to get it down, to have it, to, turn, to cut it in half by 2015, though we didn't even come close to that. And uh, of course, everybody wants to end hunger, uh, but you can see the, uh, the trend lines are now going uh, in the wrong direction. And just to look at uh, cereal production, uh, to get an idea, and cereal production is, is used, I'm using it as a proxy for, uh, obviously worth, cereal production is about 45% of world food production, but it is uh, maize, uh, rice, wheat, uh, are crops that are internationally traded for which good data exists on, on how much is produced. And, and you can see here the levels are up to, toward uh, over 26, uh, 2,600 uh, million tons. Uh, but you'll see here that the yellow lines are production and utilization, which are pretty much following and going up, and also stocks are rising. So this is just showing that, uh, in fact, uh, production has gone up almost 20% since 2009, and uh, it's not an issue of how much food is actually being produced but it's, it's more where. And also on the food price index, index uh, the, uh, the bright yellow line here is the real price of food. Although you can see some spikes, in particular in 74, 75, and uh, 2008, 9, it's basically been relatively stable. It's not that it's, it's not good, it's not skyrocketing. So um, price is also, Although it can, it can cause these short-term issues, uh, the price of food has, has been relatively stable. Now one interesting, we think about the food systems, and one interesting uh, element to look at is what has happened with uh, fish. I'm, I mean, I'm partial to fish because my background is in fisheries. But uh, the, uh, the global capture fisheries has been stable at around 90 million tons per year uh, for many years. And you'll see that's the red line, I'm sorry, that's the red line here, pretty, pretty stable. Uh, what has skyrocketed is aquaculture production here. It has moved, and actually in the 80s it was practically zero. This graph starts in 93, and is, is, is about to, and in fact I think it has now crossed uh, equal to and is going to, is projected to continue to increase above uh, the natural fisheries. Uh, the yellow line is simply showing that not all uh, this is the yellow line is the fish that's caught for food. Uh, there's some fish that's also caught for uh, for feed. So uh, this is an example of how uh, our uh, 
food uh, access and production can change rather dramatically. And, uh, and I'll get back to this uh, shortly. So let's look at the future trends now in food, food and agriculture. There are, there are three main factors that are driving the, uh, the increasing demand for food. The first is population. Uh, we're now at about 7.3 billion world population. It's projected to increase to around 9.7 billion by 2050. These numbers always fluctuate a bit and it could go as high as over 10 to 11 billion by the end of the century. Uh, of course, population growth puts pressure on all resources worldwide, but in terms of uh, food, of course, it's, it has a particular impact. The second um, factor in increasing demand is the growth in income. Uh, it's, it's very well demonstrated that increasing household income results in a changing uh, type of pattern of food consumption, particularly the consumption of more meat. And by eating more meat, whether it's uh, chicken, livestock, uh, beef, poultry, um, uh, pigs, uh, beef animals are less uh, efficient at converting grains into, uh, into flesh. And, and so you're having to essentially produce more grains to, to, get, the, to get the meat. Um, and the, the third is urbanization, where you have, as a result of urbanization, you have people not producing their own food, having to have it, uh, purchase it. There's a disconnect between production and consumption and uh, potential decline in uh, the quality of food eaten. So th these factors are pointing toward a need to uh, increase the production of crops, livestock, uh, and fish uh, by about 50% overall in the next 30 years in caloric terms. And that's a significant, uh, a significant increase. And because of the income, uh, increases in income, the uh, increase in animal-based foods would be about 70%. Now, the ways, so the issue really is how do you meet this, this uh, projected uh, need? And one way, of course, is to uh, increase the area of land that's under production. And the other is to increase the productivity for any given unit of land, as well as, as, well as other factors of production, uh, water, uh, labor, capital, uh, as well as the seeds uh, that are being used. Now, the, the challenges for meeting this, uh, this requirement, I will have, uh, we'll cover some, all of the challenges that are, are transboundary in nature, that is, they're not, they're not localized, they are across national uh, uh, boundaries. Uh, Probably the most important is the competition for natural resources, and as I mentioned, land, water, and genetic resources. Currently for land, about 37% uh, of arable, of, of, of land in the world is used for food production. 28% is uh, covered by forests, and another 31% is mainly grasslands or uh, slightly vegetated or deserts. And only 1% of land is actually used for urban urban areas and it's unlikely to go up uh, uh, much. So the pressure is going to be on particular uh, forest and land uh, if, if land use has to increase. Um, the, and, and you see this, uh, you can see this happening in say in Brazil, uh, I think it's been in the news recently, the fact that the forests in Brazil, the tropical forests are being uh, cut down at, an extreme, at a rapid rate. This is happening for two, re well, two reasons related to agriculture. One is uh, to grow soybeans, and the other is for grazing, because when you burn a forest, you know, the first thing that you get back is grasses and you can graze uh, crops. So uh, the land becomes a, a significant challenge when it comes to, to increasing food. The second is water, where 92% of uh, freshwater that is consumed uh, by the world is for agriculture. So the vast amount, of, the, the vast proportion of uh, water consumed is, is for agriculture. And 
between land and agriculture are where you have opportunities to uh, increase productivity per unit of land or per unit of water, rather than increasing the amount of land and water being used. And uh, one way of doing this is through improved uh, use of genetic resources. Uh, and, um, but this requires that the uh, natural uh, crops, uh, genetic resources be, be conserved because what we have now in terms of many of the uh, staple crops as, as well as uh, uh, pulses and, and so forth, uh, there are a vast number of unutilized species at, at, at the moment. Um, the second big challenge is the increasing uh, temperature, which is resulting uh, mainly from the uh, changes in climate. And uh, it's interesting, I'm using the word changes in climate. If you, uh, if you go in the international uh, arena these days and you listen to a U.S. official, you will not hear the word climate change. You will hear the words uh, weather events. <laughs> Okay, they are actually, there are two aspects to climate, key aspects to climate change for agriculture. One is, in fact, weather events, which are shocks that come through uh, heavy rainfall, drought, hurricanes, and so forth. Uh, but the other is the long-term effect, which is what's really critical, and that's changes mainly in temperature, which is going to drive then changes in water availability. Uh, uh, a third main challenge is uh, plant, animal, pests, and diseases. Uh, and these are exacerbated by uh, changes in climate. Uh, as temperature is a particular change, uh, you will you see uh, the movement of pests. It's also exacerbated by intensification, intensified farming. More fish or more livestock or crops uh, uh, grown uh, with more fertilizer tends to lead to uh, uh, more pests. Uh, another challenge is um, that are more fre frequent and severe and complex crises. These are both the natural crises that we've me mentioned, but also man-made, uh, whether they are uh, civil wars, uh, international wars. Uh, but you see these in, in, say, in Somalia or Yemen, where uh, large numbers of people do not have uh, the ability to grow food or even have access to food in one country, uh, fighting another, one group against another. There are, uh, many dimensions to it. And uh, climate and crises are driving migration, and it's one of the uh, factors behind migration coming from Central America, where uh, people are not able to farm anymore. Uh, the the uh, Moving to the cities is not really an option, given, given the, uh, the civil, civil difficulties in, say, Guatemala or Nicaragua, uh, El Salvador. So they're, they're moving, they're moving up to Mexico and then you see them here in, uh, in the U.S. And finally, another challenge is a slowdown in growth in agricultural trade. I not even use the word growth because agricultural trade is going to continue. I mean, it has been growing and the atmosphere now with uh, the uh, imposition of tariffs and uh, looking for more uh, uh, ability to grow things nationally means that trade is, is slowing down. Uh, and that's going to be a challenge in the future for meeting food security requirements uh, in countries which don't have enough food. So what are the opportunities then for meeting these challenges? One is to take a food system approach, and this sounds like a very uh, high pollutant term, uh, but it does, what it, what it means is looking both, taking both production and consumption together, not, not as individual crops, and uh, or sources of food. And to take more of the, I use the word food systems, but it's like a food security approach that uh, the kind of food that's being uh, grown, that's available, uh, and that is eaten has a, has a better nutritive value and is more sustainably grown. Uh, and it is, uh, it, is, it is helping to drive uh, the policy environment at both the international and national level, uh, I'm not so not so much here in the U.S., but uh, definitely in Europe and in, in uh, Asia. The second opportunity is the, the uh, evident increased consumer awareness of how our food is produced and uh, its composition. 
And this is happening, it's not just here, we know very much in the US, you, you, uh, we're all aware, we, labeling is very strong, uh, there is a big popular movement toward uh, more nutritive food, but it's happening in other countries, uh, and that's an opportunity that would help with the food system approach. Also, do things like uh, to decrease the demand of certain types of food uh, that are very energy dense, like sugar, uh, sugary drinks, uh, and so forth. Uh, third opportunity is for sustainably intensifying crop production, and uh, I will talk about that under a, a, in, a, in a couple of slides. Um, another is alternatives to meat production, and uh, here I haven't said too much about meat. Uh, as I say, chicken is the or poultry is the uh, by far and away the largest. Uh, uh, type of uh, meat produced in the world, but the, um, it's red meat and cattle that have the greatest impact on the environment because of greenhouse gas emissions and uh, also because of the dietary uh, composition. So uh, there, um, there are uh, efforts going on now to alternative meat production. Uh, also an opportunity is aquaculture, as I mentioned, to boost fish production. Although there are environmental concerns, and there are uh, consumer concerns about the content, of, for example, salmon that are grown in pens and that are fed you know, artificial feeds, what that is doing to the actual flesh of the, of the fish, and these have to be uh, looked at. But one area that there is an immediate opportunity uh, is to reduce food wastage. Uh, <coughs> currently, food wastage is about at an overall level of 30%, however, you see on this chart here um, that it there are two there are two things. One is if you here we have this is North America, industrialized Asia, Europe. So it's going from sort of developed to developing countries. So the composition of the type of food waste is differs by uh, the scale of development. In North America, uh, most of the waste, sixty one percent of the waste, is in consumption. Uh, 46 in industrialization, Asia, and 52 in, in Europe. So the target for reducing food wastage in, in these developed areas needs to be more at the consumption level, you know, less at the production level. If you move into developing countries, you'll see that the wastage is less at the consumer level, much more at the production and at the storage uh, level. So that needs to be the target. Uh, and, uh, there will always be a certain amount of waste in food, both production, storage, uh, and in consumption. Uh, we have to accept that. But uh, the current level is being uh, overall about 30% is, uh, is very high. You could make up a lot of food requirements by helping to reduce wastage. Uh, the, the key thing here is to look at the, uh, it also varies by region. If you look at North America, the wastage is at 42%. So that's, that's getting up to uh, close to half. Asia, industrialized Asia, I think this means China, uh, Thailand, you know, I don't think it's 25%, so it's much lower. Europe is only 22%, uh, and it goes down as you go uh, 19 North Africa, Latin America 15. So uh, here, we, and I think this is, is well known that, uh, that there's really a, a potential or in early we're producing food, it's a loss to the consumer, and it's a loss to the natural resources because you use the natural resources to produce food that's then wasted. Okay, now I want to focus just a minute on uh, the role of innovation because looking forward, this is really where the opportunities are for uh, addressing addressing the challenges. And in fact, innovation is the story of agriculture over 12,000 years. I mean, agriculture started when people started to be sedentary, uh, moving from wild to selected crops and uh, livestock. And uh, it really picked up uh, in the last uh, few centuries and uh, has accelerated even more in the 1960s with the Green Revolution. Uh, which involved a combination of plant breeding, 
the higher use of fertilizers, uh, the use of irrigation and pest control. And this is what allowed, for example, India uh, in the 60s and you know, early 70s to avoid falling into famine. Uh, however, there have been some uh, serious uh, side effects of the, uh, particularly the use of fertilizers, uh, of MPK, nitrogen, phosphorus, potassium fertilizers on, say, water quality uh, and, and uh, the condition of soil. But that's what got us through in the last uh, 40, 50 years in terms of meeting the and if you remember from the 60s, the population bomb and all the, the, you know, the worries about uh, food uh, deficits in the 70s, it's a green revolution to help us get out of that. Now, since the 90s, uh, we have another area, and this is, can be, it is controversial, it's the genetically modified organisms, and now moving into gene editing, where you are, we have been increasing the uh, Productivity of, uh, of plants, and not so much, oh, not animals, one fish, but mainly plants, uh, increased production, adapt to climate, uh, and uh, pest resistance. GMOs, uh, genetically modified organisms, has been the uh, introduction of foreign genes into plants. And uh, it's controversial, of course, because uh, it's not been proven that there's no harm. At the same time, it's not been proven that there is harm. The U.S. takes a, a, a view that if uh, we're not, uh, we don't have to prove that there's no harm, if it's likely that there isn't any, we go ahead. The Europeans, the European law is the precautionary approach, which is you've got to prove there's no harm. So you do not see GMOs uh, uh, in Europe. Um, some of the examples of, of uh, how GMOs have been used are say golden rice where it's essentially a biofortified rice with vitamin a that is used primarily in asia uh, the one you may be familiar with the roundup ready crops uh, which are glyphosate resistant so that you can uh, apply roundup to knock down the weeds and increase productivity um, and also uh, bt uh, cotton which is uh, there is a uh, bacteria that's bred into the cotton to resist uh, pests such as weevils. Gene editing is, and the so-called CRISPR technology is very new. And this is where there's a tremendous potential going forward because gene editing is about taking the gene, the genome of a, let's say, of a plant, and understanding, being able to sequence that gene understanding which uh, uh, strands of DNA are expressing what's in, the, what's in the plant and editing those genes to do things like cold, heat tolerance, uh, better use of water, and so forth. You're, it's likely that the very first real applications of gene editing with CRISPR, CRISPR is a tool, gene editing is what you're doing, that's why I use the word gene editing the first real uses are going to be in crops because it's very uh, relatively straightforward to do the work on crops in a short life cycle. It's not an animal, it's, uh, and, and essentially it's like uh, speeding up breeding. It's the only way I can say it. It's instead of uh, crossing varieties and getting a new plant, which you have to see whether it has what you think it has or the right traits, you're able to go into the gene, edit it, and get those traits immediately. So you may see this uh, coming up now uh, fairly soon. Uh, another is on uh, meat and dairy alternatives. I mentioned this earlier, and this is mainly um, innovation on plant-based uh, meats. The two that you may have heard of are the Impossible uh, Foods uh, meat, which has uh, now come out of the lab and is actually available in, uh, I think it's in Burger King, so it's, it's available widely. And another is Beyond Meat. Uh, they're, different, they're different products because they're, they're, they're built in a different way. Uh, but they are both plant-based. And the effects of these in the long run will be uh, if people want to eat meat, they feel they want the taste of meat that is particularly red meat, uh, that they have 
should have better nutritive qualities, although they are processed foods in the end, they're mainly soya, soya beans, and they are let, have a less of an impact on the environment. They still have an impact because you have to grow the soya, but you're not having to feed that to an animal. Instead, you're putting it directly into the food. So uh, the conversion, uh, you don't have the issue of the conversion to, to meat. So there is a, a large amount of investment going in. In fact, it's, um, some of it's here in, in uh, the Bay Area. Uh, and venture capital going into these companies. And it's, uh, if the markets, it's all gonna be about markets. If the markets hold up and the demand is there, you're gonna see this expand. Another area you hear about is indoor vertical farming. Uh, uh, here it is all it's very ener energy intensive. If it uses solar energy, uh, it's, it's, it's renewable. Uh, and it also uses the urban space uh, as you get into larger, uh, uh, larger cities. So uh, there are only certain types of things you can be able to grow in the indoor and vertical farming. It's mainly vegetables, uh, but it is, it is an interesting uh, innovation that is moving ahead. And one I threw in here is the use of insects. It's a novel food. Insects are a food in some countries already. When we were, I was in the Central African Republic, and in fact, in, in Zambia, we used to eat termites and even have uh, grasshoppers. And actually, when they're in a nice sauce, they're good. But it's more uh, that it's making foods out of certain types of insects. Uh, the biomass of insects is enormous in the world, and by far the, the most numerous uh, living organisms, uh, other than bacteria. Uh, and so that's something that even FAO has looked at as a potential source of food. Only one you think of is locusts. There are periodic outbreaks of locusts in the Sahel region, and locusts, in fact, are edible. Uh, it, there is a certain cultural yuck factor about that <laughs> <laughs> But uh, again, looking, looking to the future and so that you can, uh, you can process them. Uh, and then in terms of climate adaptation mitigation, uh, there is an emerging type of climate smart agricultural practices that combines sustainability, uh, that is uh, using inputs like land and water uh, in a way that uh, does not consume them as much uh, in soil as, as sort of high-scale uh, industrial farming um, and also that uh, helps to uh, mitigate uh, climate change. Carbon sequestration is basically the capture of CO2 by plants in, in the soil. And that's, what, that's, what, that's what's meant by sequestration. Uh, and, uh, Forests and also uh, agriculture offered an opportunity. Also, use, going back and using conservation farming, which is to plow under uh, whatever is left, uh, the, the debris after harvesting, uh, sort of old fashioned, in a way, old fashioned uh, farming techniques, but in, in, a, better, uh, in a better way. Um, also, a, a part of this is uh, reducing methane gas emission by livestock, there's not a whole lot you can do. A, a cow is going to produce a certain amount of methane from belching and from its manure, uh, but it, changing the composition, the type of livestock that raise can, can make a difference. Now, going beyond uh, innovation, you can have all this innovation. There needs to be a certain change in behavior in farmers in terms of practices for soil health, land preservation, water conservation, as I mentioned. And also, uh, particularly in developing countries, the resilience of farmers to um, uh, shocks, climate shocks, hurricanes, uh, drought, and so forth, needing both the skills and the resources to deal with them. And this is a, uh, a big push in the development community to move away from simply bringing in food when there's a, a shortfall to uh, building resilience and how, what do you do when there is a drought of storing some food on the farm uh, or changing the type of crop that you're growing. And then from the consumer side, um, it's having accessible and adequate food. Uh, that's something that consumers themselves uh, perhaps don't have so much to, to say about. But if you look, for example, in the US, uh, where in some urban areas and certainly in rural areas, you have less and less, uh, fewer supermarkets, 
uh, and being displaced by smaller stores that are only selling processed foods, not selling fresh food. And uh, this, this is, uh, is a market-driven change, but it's one that consumers can also do something about in terms of uh, where they're going to buy their food. Having nutrition and awareness of diet, and also being uh, having, uh, aware and concerned about the production methods uh, and location. Now, I want to finish with the um, with the national international action, particularly at the uh, international level. Uh, one is uh, having statistics and information to support evidence-based uh, national policies. Uh, and you, you can say, well, what does this mean? It means that when a when a country is thinking about what are we going to do on food production uh, or uh, uh, markets and so forth, that those decisions are made based on evidence of performance in other systems, data on what is being produced. A lot of policy is not done that way. In the U.S. it, it, it primarily is, because we have the information. Uh, and so what works and learn from uh, experience. Uh, secondly is uh, having international standards and, and agreements for uh, trade, uh, and these are really trade and product, production and trade. There are in place now uh, international treaties on biodiversity, the, uh, the uh, International Treaty on Plant Genetic Resources, on food safety, there are the, there's the Codex Alimentarius Commission, on pesticides, there's the International Plant Protection uh, Convention, all of which are places that uh, con countries and experts come together and agree on uh, how to preserve biodiversity, uh, how to, uh, what type of uh, food safety in terms of food additives or uh, levels of uh, minimum levels of pesticide residues, and uh, also uh, on, on, on uh, you know, plant, on plant pests in terms of what's allowable in uh, trade. And then on the animal disease side, uh, uh, this is one area where transplantary work is essential. Uh, rinder pest, which is a cattle disease, uh, was eradicated about 10 years ago through uh, international action. So it was primarily in Africa, but it, uh, because of the uh, transhumans movement of cattle, uh, that has, has a big impact on, on helping to uh, preserve cattle that are, are, are there. On foot and mouth disease, which is a contained disease in Europe and parts of Africa. Uh, it's, it's not here in, uh, in the, it's not, it's a big not in the U.S. Uh, also African swine fever, and this is one that's, that's in the news now because it has, it's trying to decimate the uh, pig populations in Asia. In China in particular, I don't know if this was covered in the last uh, presentation, but uh, China has a very high, I think, I think the number now is, is close to 20 million head of swine and uh, pigs have been, have been um, put down because of the uh, swine uh, fever and it's a virus. And another uh, one which is a zoonotic, that is uh, potential transfer to humans is avian influenza, which is mainly in Asia. And this, this one had, was a very concerted effort by national and international institutions to knock it down. It's still there, but it's, uh, it is not uh, moving around. So international cooperation is essential to address these uh, areas. And we talked just it's on the slide, but sort of the role of international institutions. In Rome, there are three food agencies. And they all have different roles. So when you may have heard about more, it's the World Food Program, which uh, is basically about saving lives with food aid. It distributes food aid to countries where there is uh, starvation or potential for starvation. Then there's FAO, its mission is to end hunger through uh, technical uh, knowledge, and that relates more to the standards, information, technology, evidence-based uh, policy advice. And then there's the International Fund for Agricultural Development, which provides uh, investment to uh, small-scale farmers uh, to help, uh, help them produce and lift them out of poverty. Uh, all these agencies, in particular FAO, works with uh, the World Trade Organization on, say, phytosanitary and the zoosanitary standards uh, for trade. 
uh, with the um, World Health Organization on Nutrition, Public Health, and also on the Committee on World Food Security, which brings together governments, uh, NGOs, and the private sector to, uh, to try to get some consensus on how to move forward. This is where you have companies like Procter & Gamble, Mars, sitting down together with NGOs uh, and governments to uh, try to agree uh, how to produce more uh, sustainably. I want to close with a map and it brings us back to a more uh, current thing, uh, situation. Today, there are 42 countries in the world that require external assistance, assistance for food. Food aid, where there is, uh, there is localized starvation going on. 32 of these are in Africa, eight in Asia, and two in Latin America and the Caribbean. The two in Latin America, the Caribbean are Venezuela and uh, Haiti. Venezuela mainly because of civil uh, issues in Haiti, and uh, more because of the devastation of uh, very earthquakes and, and uh, hurricanes and so forth. Uh, but it is a, a reminder that there is a real inequity in the distribution and access to food in the world, and uh, the need to address it both in the short term here and some of the long term issues that I've raised. So, with that, I will close, and um, I guess the next is if you have any questions. <laughs> Thank you so much, Boyd, for a fascinating and in some ways very surprising presentation. Um, we have a question over here. In uh, the list that you just, thank you for your presentation. In the list that you showed about um, what are the developments or the things that are being tried and that sort of thing, despite the fact that on the almost the first slide you showed aquaculture as being the biggest change in production of any kind of foodstuff. There's nothing in this last list that says aquaculture is being worked on or developed by governments or anything. I'm rather surprised about that. Okay. Uh, aquaculture development has been almost a purely private sector uh, development that has occurred with relatively little regulatory oversight. I mean, the issues are about salmon and pen culture has environmental impact, uh, and some land-based aquaculture systems uh, have water quality uh, impacts. Uh, I think what's important to realize is that it's in terms of the amount of food that's being produced by aquaculture and fisheries, it's relatively low. It's a 90 million. Uh, tons uh, where you have uh, livestock production is in, is in a thousand millions of tons. So it's, it's not going to have a significant impact on helping to increase food. It's rather saying, well, people want to eat fish. Uh, we cannot increase. It's, it's not going to be possible to increase the take the, from natural fisheries in the oceans. I mean, it's been stable, 90 million. Some fisheries are now are starting to go down. So uh, there is a limit, I think, is what you can do with aquaculture, uh, either in pens in the sea or on land. And that may be why I didn't mention it, but it is important, that's for sure. How serious do you consider the new effects of tariffs that have a great effect on agricultural products? Um, well, tariffs exist. They, they are there now. There is no tariff-free uh, trade, uh, very little tariff-free trade going on in, uh, in food. Um, I can give you an example from where we live in Maine. Uh, lobster attracted uh, a 25% tariff uh, from China based on the most recent tit-for-tat. The result is Maine is no longer exporting a lobster to China is a big market. Instead, the Canadians are buying Maine lobster and exporting it to China. <laughs> so tariffs are an artificial construct in any case, and there are almost always ways to, to get around. It means, I think the, 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 I have not, I don't want to get into politics, but the unfortunate thing that's happening is that farmers in the U.S. are being paid not to produce, essentially being paid not to produce, 
because of the tariffs are coming in place, they're not able to export, and they're being given uh, subsidies as a result. And in the long run, that is not good, because it means either these farmers are going to get out of farming, uh, but this food, you know, in the short run, it's, it's not a problem, because we have enough food, but if this continues, uh, it, and it probably won't, because the fact is that China, and I, I didn't get into this in the presentation, but China uh, has uh, a relatively uh, little, little land and water compared to its population. So it is, it is, it is a food importer, and that food importer, and it has, China has been, uh, you may have heard of this concept of land grabbing. In Africa, it's not really the case, but the fact is that China is moving into other countries, uh, investing and producing food and, and bringing it back uh, as if they produced it. So. I think tariffs, tariffs are a short-term issue right now. Thanks, Boyd, for your talk. Um, I'm wondering about the situation of forced migration. I don't know how much of it it is. It gets a lot of publicity when there are wars or pervasive violence or climate changes, desertification, where people are forced from their own land and their own communities, either to other parts of their same country or across borders. And it would seem to me that very often these are, are farming people, farmers and farm workers, and they're pushed on the land that is owned by somebody else and is being worked by somebody else. So they can't continue to be farmers and farm workers, and it probably just causes more conflict where they land. And I'm wondering how, how pervasive this is and uh, if there are any solutions uh, on site. You know, it is a short, it, it, it is a localized issue. I mentioned uh, Central America, the, the, uh, the triangle. I, I'll give you an example from my own time in, um, in Africa. When we lived in Zambia, uh, there was a I don't know, half a million, maybe close to a million people from Mozambique who had moved across the border into Zambia during the time of the, uh, they were living right on the border on the other side. You can actually see it with a Landsat picture you could actually make out the border because which is a straight line because uh, they were living in camps and basically denuding the, the area when the conflict ended in 1992 they all went back they did not want to stay and first of all they, they were in a different in an area as you say different from that they didn't own the land so there, there are uh, you know it, it was not necessarily a permanent uh, permanent problem. Even here in the U.S., although it's it's not the Central Americans, but you see their movement going across the southern border all the time, and this is this is this has been going on for for centuries. So uh, I think what's what's more critical is that if the changes are permanent, changes that's uh, a climate or related to climate, then you're going to have issues about people move to urban areas because the trend is to move to urban areas or onto other land, and then you want conflict. The extent to which it's, uh, I don't think it's how widespread it is, I think it's localized. Uh, yeah. uh, historically, so many famines, like the Irish famine, uh, Ukraine famine, uh, North Korean famine, and you can name many, they were all caused by government mismanagement, or government deliberately starving their people. How can international organization prevent um, government mismanagement of food distribution to prevent famine? Very, very difficult. Uh, UN organizations are member-based. Uh, I have been in many meetings where this very issue is discussed about countries like North, North Korea. As a number. Uh, what, I mean, other than sanctions, of course, sanctions often hurt uh, farmers and consumers. They don't help them. They, help them. they try to hurt the government. Is a matter of uh, pressure coming. Sorry, I have to stand closer to the mic. Yes. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, putting pressure on uh, those governments from not necessarily from the UN, but by from their protectors, I mean, in the case of North Korea would be from China. Um, I think 
the thing that does not help, and it's, it's, it, it is to bring in, uh, we, have this, we have this issue now in Venezuela. How much aid, food aid do you want to provide? Are you propping up the government as a result of that? And on the other hand, you don't want to, uh, you don't want to hurt to the extent possible the uh, individuals, the farmers or the consumers. So the international arena provides an opportunity for governments to, to talk, to bring to the table. The UN it would be the Security Council, and the Security Council can actually sort of wrap countries on the knuckles and can actually take some action if necessary, even military action if it was felt appropriate. I don't think it's ever happened when it comes to uh, famines. Uh, the critical countries for this now are Yemen, and, uh, a war going on, people basically starving, and even the World Food Program cannot go into Yemen uh, at the moment. Um, so, I mean, it's up, it's up to countries to, to either work together or otherwise we go off on their own. Yeah, I have a question about uh, food as a commodity as opposed to food sovereignty, in that I understand that the IMF was loaning money, in the past at least, to small developing countries with an effort to increase their GDP, resulting in giving money to monocultural activity, which is basically big corporations, whereas the small farmers were unable to grow uh, products to be consumed locally. I understand that this might be changing and that uh, instead of concentrating on the GDP of a country, that they might be giving more of these loans, which does not help that, but brings better food to be consumed locally. Can you comment on that? No, in fact, it, has, it is a recognized issue. And in fact, we just started what's called the Decade of Family Farming which is to promote more uh, small-scale uh, local farming as compared to uh, commodity, uh, large base, large commodity farming. The whole issue of food sovereignty is, is uh, very sensitive to many governments. I was in a meeting in Argentina where Argentina is a very large producer of soybeans and exporter of soybeans. They would not accept any words like food sovereignty in any UN document because it implies that the large scale farmers may lose their, not lose their subsidies, but they would, they would uh, lose government support in favor of the smaller scale farmers. And so because of political issue uh, inside, inside the country, but the UN has recognized that uh, family farming as part of this sort of food systems approach because it's promoting smaller scale farming, using better seeds and fertilizers, uh, makes uh, food available locally, you tie it into school feeding programs, so there's a demand. In other words, if you, uh, government says, uh, allows for lunches in school, it seems very simple, but it can have a big Im impact. L uh, school lunches, so you have better nutrition, at the same time, you do, it's local pr production, you, you uh, generate local, local demand for, for local production as opposed to commo uh, large commodity production for processed food. So, but again, if the private sector is getting financing, not necessarily from the IMF, it may be coming, coming from, you know, it comes from, from the companies themselves or from, uh, from buyers, uh, you're gonna see commodities being grown one way or the other. I related to that, I think in India I heard that the uh, some of the farmers with the Green Revolution were having to buy expensive seeds and fertilizer and even some terminator seeds from Monsanto that only go for one season. So the wealth of the farmer was not passed on in the form of seeds for the next year's crop. And then some of them were going broke and even committing suicide. Have you heard of any of these negative effects of the Green Revolution like in, in even India and Mexico? Um. Now, I'm not aware of any particular instances with, with uh, uh, UN food aid. Uh, it, it may be that, you know, the U.S. is the largest contributor of grains for commodities for the World Food Program's uh, uh, relief efforts. Uh, 
and some of those may end up being these uh, term terminated uh, one-use seeds, basically, you can't reuse them. Uh, but that's not a policy of the UN, but it may, have been, it may indeed be imposed by the donors of the, of the seeds, and that is primarily the U.S., and Monsanto being the largest grow, you know, one of the largest provider of seeds uh, for commodities uh, in the U.S. So it's an issue about uh, what's appropriate to give, to provide in an aid context for uh, seeds for, for rebuilding crops, uh, as opposed to what's available in the market in the country, because I don't think you're talking about what's available in the market. Could it be both? Could it be both? Both, yeah. Um, I think if, it, if the market is open, then you're likely to see those type of seeds. I understand that uh, a lot of the countries on the West African coast there, which you have in orange, that are already suffering from various kinds of food assistance needs. Uh, these were big fishing countries. These were countries where the, one of the principal livelihoods was traditional fisheries, going out with dozens of men into with shallow boats and doing their job. Uh, now that the mega fishing fleets of China and Russia and other countries are using their waters, my question is, is there any kind of enforcement mechanism to protect those countries from completely losing their fishing industry? Well, that's, good. that's a good question. Um, indeed, uh, the, art the artisanal fisheries in West Africa have, have been, and I think are still fairly important. And one of the issues you face in West Africa is a very a large population increase. I mean, Nigeria is now uh, well over 100 million people. So even if the fishing stayed at the same level, it would, it would be feeding, trying to feed a much larger group. But in terms of enforcement, uh, <coughs> right now there's a 200 mile uh, limit on national waters. Uh, so artisanal fishermen in general are not going to go out at a level uh, distance. So if uh, a country has, has the capacity to enforce, which is either from its own resources or it calls on partners and donors to help them, if they're willing to do that, they should be able to enforce uh, that limit. However, what you see are, and this, ha this happens in a place like Angola, which has a very, uh, in Namibia, which have very strong uh, offshore fisheries, agreements struck with fishing nations in Europe and Japan in particular, that allow those countries to come in and fish and perhaps leave some of the fish in the country and take the rest. And the question is who's benefiting from that? Uh, probably not the local fishermen. It's been like the oil industry. Who's benefiting from the oil industry in Nigeria? It's not going to be not so much oil. Uh, there are uh, there is an international agreement now called um, the Port State Measures Agreement, only recently ratified, that does require that all uh, na nations that sign on to the agreement that any uh, international fishing vessel that calls into that port must uh, can be arrested uh, or must must comply with international rules and regulations on, on fishing. Uh, and this was designed to, because, because it's very, you know, a lot of fisheries are on the high seas where there is in fact really no law, uh, but they do need to call into ports and uh, that's the place you can try to enforce. Uh, fisheries is a whole other topic. It's, it's very interesting kind of things that uh, go on in terms of uh, where fishing takes place, who does it, and uh, the type of enforcement. Well, boy, thank you very much for... Uh...